This screencast is focused on Summer 16 Question 2, focused particularly on foreign operations in a consolidation question. So again, I'm assuming you've read through the question. If not, please do pause it, read through the requirements, and at least make some attempt at the start of the question uh, to see can you attempt it yourself. So it is useful in terms of any FX consolidation question to have some approach of how some structured approach and how you go through each of the steps. So we're going to go through seven steps in terms of approaching one. And you may change it differently or may refine it. The first two steps are really getting to grips with what's been asked. So read the requirements and briefly review all the notes to get an idea of what's coming up in the question. So again, if you want, pause it now, read through the steps or maybe take them down and see can you go back and try the question again yourself if you did struggle with it using those steps. What's unusual about the uh, foreign operation is your first step in terms of calculations will be to translate the statement of financial position using IAS 21. So there's particular rules there. We have to firstly translate the SOFP to get a euro statement of financial position and we'll have a plug figure then for retained earnings. We'll then go on and calculate some cumulative differences. So the FX difference is one and two. And then we'll proceed as normal doing our goodwill and any other workings and at the very end, before we finish, we also have maybe another one or two um, FX differences, with their FX difference to do with goodwill, because we'll have to retranslate it, and possibly an FX difference to do with any fair value adjustment. So you can see some of the steps are very the same uh, as a lot of the normal consolidation questions. We just have a couple of extra workings to do for translating the financial statements and calculating specifically particular FX differences. But the first two will be just to read the question to understand what's come up. So for X1, there were two requirements, prepare the splocky and prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. Now for completeness here, we're also going to prepare the cons consolidated statement of changes in equity just for tutorial purposes. But again, I have a quick look through the question. We only had two entities in this question, X1 and Y end. And you can see here X1 is the parent and Y end actually has a different currency, uh, the Gruppy. So Y end is the functional currency is different than the parent, therefore you're going to have to use IAS 21 rules. So nothing unusual as you go down through the question. Similar, you have a splocky, you need to watch out for the other income. There may or may not be adjustment depending on the notes to the question. So again, I won't spend too much time, I assume you yourself have gone on and read through the question. It's a fairly standard um, consolidation question you have a goodwill working you have some goodwill impairment you have intergroup balances and of course they give you the, the exchange rates to use for IAS 21 at the very end so it's not the longest ever exam standard questions but again it is important that you be able to practice uh, translating a foreign subsidiary uh, using IAS 21 so that kind of gives us an idea we have one parent and one sub we have one or two intergroup balances and the date of acquisition, we we'll go back and find it, was the first of the year. So that is important that this is a current year acquisition, so you will have no prior year adjustments. So that makes things a slightly bit easier in terms of a question. So our next step now is to translate the statement of financial position uh, using IAS 21 rules. Now, as per typically for any other question, I would typically tell students to lay out a structure before you start the question. So I've just laid out the parent plus the sub plus any adjustments plus group. So if it's just a structure there that as you go through the question, you can slot them in. The same for the statement of financial position. And I'll just leave a page for my consolidated statement of change in equity as well. You'll note I haven't put in Y end because remember in the question, Y end's functional currency is the gruppy. So you cannot just put them straight in. You need to translate them using IS21. So we'll do that first and then we'll slot them in. So our first working is going to be to translate the given statement of financial position. So all I have here is Y end SOFP in groupies. So this 28010 total assets matches the 28010 total assets here. So all we're trying to do is we need to get a euro statement of financial position as our starting point. And that's your third step in any statement of or FX subsidiary question, you need to translate the statement of financial position. And the general rules are all assets and liabilities at the year end will be at the closing rate, so the, the FX rate at the reporting date, uh, 
Any ordinary share capital will be at the historic rate, i.e. the rate of the date of acquisition, and I typically tell students leave the retained earnings as a plug figure. And we'll see what that means as we go along. So for all the assets and the liabilities, we're going to use the closing rate, which in this case here is the 31st December 2015, 1.9. So it's 1.9 here. Similarly, it's 1.9 for all the current assets, for the non-current liability, and for all the current liabilities. So you're saying you're going to translate all these groupy amounts by dividing by 1.9. And that will give you the euro amount that you're going to consolidate in um, for the statement of financial position for y -end. So that gives us total assets in euro terms of 14,472, or 742, should I say. And you have liabilities then non-current, dividing by the 1.9. And similarly, you're dividing by the 1.9 for each of the current liabilities as well. So that's always your, your first port of call when you have a foreign operation, is you retranslate the statement of financial position. All assets and liabilities are at the closing rate. Any ordinary share capital will be at the rate at the date of acquisition. You acquired on the 1st of January, 15. So you use the 1.83. 1.83. Now, there is the general rule is you should use any pre-acquisition retained earnings should be at the 1.83 as well. But it's, it's typically easier at the start to leave all retained earnings as a plug. So leave all that retained earnings as a plug figure. And that essentially plug figure you can figure out will make everything balance. So you want this figure here when you add all your liabilities plus your retained earnings plus your ordinary share capital you want that to become you want that figure to be matching your total assets so that's what we mean by a plug figure your plug figure here is essentially to start with your total assets and take off everything else that you have in equity and liabilities. So that's just a plug figure to make it balance. It's typically our plug figure there is 10,427. And that's important because the plug figure contains a number of items. Right. So one, it contains pre-acquisition retained earnings at fx rate 1.83 so the first one it contains just tidy up that it first it contains some amount of pre-acquisition retained earnings at the foreign exchange rate so 1.83 so that's the ias 21 rule is any pre-acquisition retained earnings should be translated at the 1.83 it may also then contain post-acquisition because remember, you've, you've owned it for the last year. At the average rate, which in this case is 1.87. And the final one it also includes is the cumulative FX differences, 1 and 2. So again, we can work out all of them because we need now to... That plug figure includes the pre-acquisition retained earnings which we need for our goodwill calc. It needs our post-acquisition retained earnings, which we need for group retained earnings and our NCI. It's because we need the post-acquisition earnings to know how much, um, what percentage goes to group retained earnings and what percentage goes to the NCI. And in this case, you have 90% to the group and 10% to the NCI. And finally, then this will go to the FX reserve under IS21 or the NCI. So depending on what portion, you go 90% to the FX reserve. So you need to actually strip that out and put in an extra line. So that's an important thing. You need to bring in an extra line because in IS21, you have to show the FX differences separately. So we typically leave it as a plug figure to start with. And when we go to our initial journals, our initial workings, uh, we split that out and we prove what the plug figure is. So that's your first point, is you've now translated the statement of position, so you can slot it in. So we know our PPE, 
in euro terms is actually 8484. So we can slot that in. You know the inventory in this question here is 2400 or 2.4 million. Similarly with the invent or the trade receivables and cash. So once you have that done, you can actually start filling in some of the columns because you know exactly um, what it is. So you know what they are in euro terms because you've translated them. Similarly, you know ordinary share capital, which again is going to be eliminated anyway, is 546. You know the retained earnings is the plug figure, 10427. And you know long term borrowings is 1063, but we've translated there. And all the current liabilities are the figures that we've translated here as well. So that's your first step. It takes a small bit of time, but it gets you to a position now where you can do a lot more console calculations because you have the subsidiary in euro terms. So that's your first protocol is to translate it and set it up. So now that we've set up the statement flange position, we go on to our next step. So our next step here is prepare the working to calculate the cumulative FX differences in the plug figure. So we need to calculate FX difference one and two. Now note, there is no prior acquisition here. So all of the FX differences we calculate are current year differences. So they will all go to the splocky. So that's important. So we're going to do journal one here, which is your, always your next step is calculate FX difference one, which is to do with net assets and FX difference two, which is to do with profits. So you will always be calculating these regardless of what question it is, because you will always have both of those differences. So calculate FX difference one and two. So remember as part of our plug figure, they are already in that figure. So they're already netted in there. So we need to strip them out because IS21 says you have to show them separately. So we'll deal with FX difference one first. We need to get opening net assets this time in the 1st of January because that's when the acquisition date was. So you've ordinary share capital and you have retained earnings. So we have two here. So we just do it in, you need to do groupies first. We look at the statement financial position. You're told here ordinary share capital was 1 million groupies. So we'll put in 1 million there. And the retained earnings at the date of acquisition, you're actually told in the question 14080. But of course, you could approve that as well because taking 19850 minus the profit for the year would have got you back to the 1st of January as well. So the examiner has been nice there. They told you what the opening retained earnings was. You would have been able to figure that out for yourself as well. So the opening net assets, which is the net assets at acquisition, just so happens this is in the current year here, so it's not as complicated as other questions, is 15080. And to get FX difference 1, you compare that at the historic rate and compare it to at the closing rate. Remember, that's one reason you'll do your initial calculations at the historic rate, but then, of course, the closing rate may be different, which causes an FX difference. And that is what's known as FX difference 1 in IS21. So the 15 million groupies at the historic rate, which is 1.83, remember, that is the, the rate at the date of acquisition, that will get you a value of 8240. However, if we retranslated it, the 15080 groupies at the closing rate, which is 1.9, it would only get you 7937. So that suggests there's been a translation loss of 304. And so translation loss there, so I'll just put it the other way around. FX loss. And note that is all in current year because it all occurred, uh, the acquisition was a current year acquisition. So if you were to and a prior acquisition, you'd have to do a small bit of extra calcs to figure out what the difference was for prior year and what the difference was for the current year. So that's your first FX loss, FX difference one. We also then have to figure out, actually, there's a second foreign exchange difference to do with the profits. 
So fx difference 2. And this is due to the fact that profits under IS21 are translated at the average rate in this blocky, but all the assets and liabilities, which of course are related to those, are translated at the closing rate, as we've done in the statement of financial position. So that will also result in an FX difference, either a gain or loss. So the profits for the period in groupies was 5770. And again, you can see that from the question. 5770, because we own it for the full year, so we take the full profits. Again, if that was a prior year acquisition, you'd have to look at prior year profits and current year profits. And again, you're looking at, now it's at the average rate, which is the IS21 rule. Compare that to at the closing rate, because that's what everything else has been translated. So it's 5770 divided by 1.87 because the average rate, and be careful here, it's for 2015, is 1.87, which is th just over 3 million euros. Whereas if you divide it by 1.9, which is the closing rate, it only gets you 3037. So in that case, you also have an FX loss to the tune of 49. And that is FX difference 2. So we now have two FX losses. So total FX difference, one and two, because we need that for our retained earnings calculation, is 49 plus 304. So our total loss there is 352. And where that shows up, that will show up in the OCI, so put a label there, uh, in the current year's blocky. So FX, any FX differences under IS21 always shows up in the OCI in the current year. So that is an important one. So essentially what you need to do is you need to take it out of retained earnings. So you credit retained earnings. And you might ask, well, why are you crediting? Because retained earnings is actually depressed. So if we look in here, this 10427 includes a loss of 352 it shouldn't so it should be 352 higher that's why you credit it you take it out 352 Let's be accurate and always for fx difference one and two you will debit group retained earnings its share and you will also sorry that's wrong you'll debit what's called an fx reserve so under is 21 you have to create a separate thing in the equity section so it's essentially in the equity section. And you'll also debit the NCI, their portion. So 90% goes to an FX reserve. And 10% will go to the NCI to reduce the NCI. So under FX difference 1 and 2, you'll always apportion to the NCI as well. 35 to the NCI and 317 to a new working called FX reserve. So that's our first point. And again, it's useful, although it's not needed, we can prove proof of the retained earnings plug. So remember, just for tutorial purposes, we said the retained earnings plug of 10.427 is made up of three things. So I'll bring those down so we can see can we prove this. So the retained earnings plug of 10.427 contains the pre-acquisition retained earnings, so I'll leave that in groupies. So one, it contains the pre-acquisition retained earnings, which were told in the question were 14080. So that's the pre-acquisition retained earnings. And they would have been translated at 1.83. So that's one portion of the plug figure. So that amounts to, in euro terms, 7694. So that's your first section. That's the point one, which we have up here, which is the one. So what I might do is just bring them over instead. Make it easier. So that's the first one. Pre ac Second one is post acquisition. Post acquisition we know was the 5770 because we've just done the working. And that would have been retranslated at 1.87 as per the IS21 rules. 
So that would have been it to the amount of 3086. So again, we have two figures. We know that the plug should be made up of those. And we've also just calculated what the FX differences are. And note this is the full FX difference because we only apportion it once we take it out. And the full FX difference is minus 352. So minus 352. Right, that's in euro terms. So that comes over here. So you have three things then. You've pre-acquisition translated one rate, the historic rate. Post-acquisition profits translated the average rate and the FX differences. Summing them up gives you your 10, 4, 2, 7. Therefore, we know we're correct. We've proved that plug and we know we're on the right track that we've calculated this correctly and we've calculated those correctly. So actually, the true retained earnings figure, that's important, is actually just 7694 plus 3086. So it's 10780. So the other 352 that was in that plug figure needs to be taken out as we've done and shown separately. So it's 10780. That's the true retained earnings figure. So before we go on then, we just need to set up a few workings because we're going to need them. We'll always have our working one. It's goodwill and we'll come to that now in a second. But we'll also have a new working now called FX Reserve. So this is your, you're going to have a new one because it's an IS21 question. We'll have a group retained earnings working. And we'll also then working for have the NCI. So again, as with other questions, my advice is have those set up that as you're going through then all the smaller journals, you can slot in your adjustments. So in this case, we'll slot in here FX difference one and two, and I'll cross reference there journal one. And the parents portion of FX difference one and two. So the is 317. So I've just slotted that in. And similarly then for your NCI, they have a different portion as well. They are getting 35. And that's both from journal 1. So the best thing is to do is slot it in as you go along. We know we've made those two adjustments, so we'll slot them in there. Now notice you don't need to put in this adjustment because remember this adjustment is just figuring out what the correct true retained earnings figure so that can take a while to get used to but we'll see how we finish off group retained earnings in a second we don't actually make this at 352 adjustment we just take this full figure when we're calculating post acquisition profits but for now leave it as is and we'll come back to it as we finish the question so that's one main chunk of work done for IS21 our next part then is proceed as normal with consolidation using the translated SOFP in particular, calculate the goodwill. So this time we're going to calculate goodwill at the historic spot rate. And then we're going to have to retranslate goodwill because that is FX difference 3 at the end of the year. So you calculate it based on the historic rate and then retranslate it. And that is FX difference 3. So let's do our goodwill calc. You have the investment slash fair value. So we have the total parent which is 90% and then we have the NCI which is 10% so we know what the parent invested from the question if you go up parent invested 8420 and that is in euro terms because that is the parents accounts so 8420 and we're also told in note 1 that the NCI is measured at fair value so it's 900,000 so that is important. If it's measured at method two, that means any goodwill impairment will be split between the NCI and the parent. So that remember that and I draw a link between those. If it's measured at fair value, that is an impact on how we deal with the impairment. So then we figure out the fair value of net assets at acquisition. And again, we need these in euros. So you're going to use the translated amounts you'll have done for working one. So you, when you're calculating goodwill initially, you'll always use the historic rate. So it's going to be the historic rate is 1.83. So 
So it's going to be 1.83 and you have 1 million. So it's 1 million divided by 1.83 and you have 14080 divided by 1.83. So the net assets at acquisition were 8240, which essentially was the answer we've done already. So there is a lot of duplication uh, in the setting up of these foreign exchange questions. So that means the goodwill at acquisition. I'll just bring these down. Goodwill at acquisition will be 9320 minus 8240. So it's goodwill and acquisition is just over 1 million euro. That won't be the goodwill at the year end because there's a couple of movements that are happening since then. So goodwill and acquisition is 1 million euro. And of course, you can split that out if you wish um, between the parent and the NCI. So the NCI obviously has 10%. Just tidy them up. The parent's portion of the goodwill is a million and four. And the NCI's is about 76. So you don't need to show that split, but you do need to remember that this is the method two, which will have implications for our goodwill impairment. So that's your first protocol. Calculate goodwill as normal using the historic exchange rate to figure out the euro fair value of net assets. You then have to deal with another FX difference. So we're going to do that with journal two because goodwill will also always have an FX difference. So that is known as FX difference three. So we'll do that journal two, FX difference three. So we have goodwill translated at historic rate, and that came to 1080. We said goodwill at the historic rate was 1 million and 80. That was again at 1.83. But under IS21, you must retranslate goodwill at the closing rate as well. So every time you must retranslate them at the closing rate. So that means you take the 108 your euros, you bring it back by multiplying by 1.83, so bring it back to groupies, and then divide by the 1.9, which is the closing rate. So that's a little tricky is, you have it in euros, so you bring it back to groupies first, and retranslate it at the closing rate. So here then, you have the updated goodwill, is 1040, meaning you have an FX loss, do that the right way, you have an FX loss, of 40. So goodwill needs to be reduced by 40 because it has to be retranslated at the closing foreign exchange rate. So therefore you credit goodwill 40. And be careful here. This time you will debit FX reserve but you'll also debit NCI solely because the NCI is measured at using method 2. If the NCI was measured using method 1 i.e. with no goodwill attached all of the goodwill FX difference would go to the FX reserve. So that's a little trick to watch out for. If it's method two, you need to apportion. So here it's 40 times 0.9 and 40 times 0.1. So now we need to slot in those little journals into our bigger workings. So you're going to have goodwill, FX difference or FX loss, reference journal two, reduce goodwill by 30. We'll just tidy up the formatting. So we're going to reduce it by, so it should be 40. Reduce it by 40. And then you're also going to slot it into the FX reserve. So we now have FX difference 3. And I'll slot in that correct figure as well. So that figure is minus 36. 90% goes to FX reserve. So minus 36 there. And then you're going to have a minus 4 for the NCI. So you're always tracking them as you go along. It makes the 
question a lot easier to finish off than at the very end. So all I've done there is I've put my smaller journals into my bigger workings. So here I've put reduced the goodwill by 40, meaning my updated goodwill now is my 1040, which is it retranslated at the closing rate. Similarly, I brought in FX difference 3 into my FX reserve working, and I brought in my FX difference 3 for the NCI as well. Right, so that's our next journal done. Our next adjustment then will be actually the goodwill impairment. So you'll always do um, the translation before you do the impairment. And the impairment then, journal 3, is relatively straightforward. You're crediting goodwill as before. One, two, five. Now before that, I just remember, this also goes to the OCI. So we don't forget to label it. So it's a current year loss. The full amount goes... And again, it will be going towards the uh, subsidiary as well. That has to, you allocate some portion of that to the subsidiary because they have a certain share of it. So if you want to put OCIS, I uh, probably should have put OCIS up there as well. So S to signify that some share of that would be apportioned to the NCI at the very end. So similarly with goodwill, the impairment is 125. And because you have method two, your debit group retained earnings. Remember, this is nothing to do with FX now. This is just a normal impairment. So 90% goes to group retained earnings. And 10% goes to the NCI. All right, so that's a relatively straightforward working as before. And again, that will it won't go to the OCI, it will go to the Splocky, and it's to do with the subsidiary. Because you're splitting it between the group and the NCI. So the S is just to remind us we need to split that and adjust the NCI's profit allocation at the very end. That was a very a, a basic console intergroup adjustment where we'll now reduce our goodwill impairment. So impairment journal three minus one two five meaning our goodwill at year end Goodwill at year end is now 915. So we've now finished our goodwill and we can slot it in. It's 915. So we go there, working one. Goodwill, we don't mind anything else there. We're just going to slot in at the end. It's 915. We know we've no other adjustments there. We've dealt with the FX loss and we've dealt with the impairment. And then don't forget to slot in here. You have goodwill impairment. I'm sure the examiner is journal three. So just take down the format. And the goodwill impairment, the portion for the retained earnings is about 113, if you're rounding. And then similarly, the NCI gets their share as well. They get 10%, which is, it'll be rounding to 13, but it's technically 12.5. So, the one difference is all FX differences go straight into the NCI, whereas for the parent's share, they're kept in a separate line item. So they're all brought together for the NCI, but they're kept separate for the parent's share. So that's our three workings done, three journal adjustments. Journal three impairment, journal two FX difference three. Now with journal four is intra group trading. So there, there are given some information here about the intergroup trading. We're told trade receivables of X1 includes a 240 receivable from Y end. Right? And total sales made to the subsidiary Y end during the year amounts to 530. And note 4 is linked to note 3. All goods were used in production during the year end. So again, always when you have intergroup trading, you have three things. One is you have your top line adjustments. So you need to remove intergroup sales intergroup costs. So here then, you're going to debit revenue, credit cost of sales, to reduce the intergroup amount, 530, 530. Now you can slot them in as you go, or we can leave them from the end. Right, so we can slot, because we have a couple of things to leave to slot in there, so we'll slot them in at the end as we prepare our splocky. You do can put them in as you go. So first thing is your top line adjustments. Next thing is unrealized profit inventory. 
Here, there's no unrealized profit because all the goods were gone. None of the goods are still in inventory. They've all been used. So you may not have come across that before where you don't have any goods left. That means there's no unrealized profit. All the profit has been realized. And the final third thing with any intergroup trading is the intergroup balances. When you're told there's a trade receivable outstanding. Therefore, you're assuming that that matches off if you're not told anything else. So you will credit trade receivables and your debit trade payables to the tune of 240. And all you have to do is slot those in as two adjustments to your statement of financial position. You're going to reduce trade receivables by 240 and reduce your trade payables by 240 as well. So nothing too complicated there. But again, just show the examiner you've brought in the adjustments and you know exactly uh, where they need to go. So that was our final adjustment in terms of intergroup trading. Remove the top line and remove the intergroup balances. So now we've the majority of the question done, other than finishing off our workings to figure out what each of the line items should be. So we've already finished our working one, goodwill. Our FX difference, our FX reserve, all you have to do is tot it up. And its answer will be 353 FX reserve at the year end. So all we're going to do is slot in working to FX reserve. You should have remembered to leave a line in your setting up the structure. Because if it's an FX subsidiary, you're always going to have an FX reserve. And that FX reserve is now minus 353. That's another figure slotted in. And again, always remember where the marks are going for. The main marks will be going for the retained earnings, the goodwill, and the FX reserve, and the NCI. All the ones that we typically do out as explicit workings. So that's our goodwill. That's our FX reserve. Group retained earnings we calculate as normal. You start with your parent. Parent's retained earnings at year end. And we know that from the question, the retained earnings is the next page 26580 so we know the parent is 26580 but we now need to figure out post acquisition profits from y end so we need to figure out how much they are and the parent's share is 90 percent so remember the post acquisition profits you can either do it two ways this way is relatively straightforward because we already know we own it for the current whole year. So it's really just the 5770 groupies divided by 1.87. So it's the 5770 for the year divided by um, 1.87, which is the average. Now, alternatively, what you can do is you can go back to what we normally do and we take the retained earnings at the end of the year. And this is where we come back to this 10780, the true retained earnings figure at the end of the year. And you take away minus the pre-acquisition retained earnings, which we calculated as 7694. So if we take both of those away from each other, that also leaves us with 3086. That method may be more appropriate when you have a prior acquisition because you can't just work it out from the current year's p &L. So it just happens to be aligned here because we owned it for the full year. But taking the true retained earnings figure and taking off pre-acquisition is probably the easier way to go about it. So that's where that 352 we said to leave until now. That's how that comes into play. And 90% of that then will be 2777. So with no other adjustments, it's a relatively short um, console adjustment question. So that means retained earnings at the end of the year is 29 Two four five. So retained earnings at the end of the year will be two nine two four five, and just cross reference that working three in. Gets me to two nine two four five. And that's another one slotted in. And our final working then is working for NCI. So you come down to your NCI, very similar to what you always do. So. This foreign subsidiary really only has one or two additional workings. Everything else remains the same. You start off with value at acquisition as per working one. It was 900,000 is what it was worth. That was its fair value 
an acquisition, this figure here. And we then also have to bring in the post acquisition profits. So you're always doing the same working. But in this case, you're looking at the NCI share. And the NCI share here will be only 10%. So it's very similar. Of all the post acquisition profits, you are always split it between the group retained earnings working and the NCI working. 90% in this case to group and 10% to the NCI. So totting those up gets us NCI at the end of the year to be 1157. Again, you can see that's where the bulk of the marks are going for. So you should, should ensure that they're comfortable at calculating the NCI at the end of the year and also calculating the group retained earnings. So working forward then, NCI will be 1157. And now that we've all the main workings done, everything else, all we're going to do is simply tot across. So you no adjustments to the PPE. So you just sum the parent's value plus, and be careful here, you always sum the translated value of the subsidiary. So not the group amount, you want the euro amount, which is 8484. And similarly then, you do that down for the other ones as well, for current assets. We're just summing across, we have only one adjustment uh, in our current assets, that's for trade receivables. And that gets us to a total asset figure of 47697. So it's really the exact same final structure in terms of approach to the question. There's only a, additional workings early on in the question to get the euro amounts and determine all the relevant FX differences. For the equity portion, again, you know you don't have any of the subsidiaries' equity in there. So it's 2 million, 300 for the parent, 600 for the parent, and we've already our other workings done. So that is, makes us very easy to tot up what the total equity will be. We're just adding across, you always strip out the share capital, the 546, because remember that 546 is already gone into our goodwill working. So we don't want to double count it. That's where it's gone in. So that comes out, giving us total equity of 32,948. And we then go down along. We just sum up our other liabilities. We have only one adjustment for an intergroup balance, giving us total equity and liabilities of current liabilities of 10,6, Long-term liabilities or non-current liabilities of four and 32,948 for your total equity, giving us again, thankfully, 47,697, which balances. So you can see actually finishing off the question in terms of um, foreign subsidiary is the exact same as a normal question. Once you've converted it to euros and determined the FX differences, you're back to a normal traditional consolidation question. So that's preparing the statement of financial position. We now have to prepare the consolidated blocking as well. Now we haven't put in here, we've X over 12, it should be 12 over 12 because we've owned it for the full year. And we need, now need to convert the groupie based blocky in using the average rate. So you're dividing everything by 1.87 because that is um, the rule in IS21. The Splocky is always translated at the average rate for the period. So it'll be 50.0220 divided by 1.87. It will be minus 35.640 divided by 1.87. So you can do this as you go along. There's nothing there. It'll be minus 3540.450.87. It will be at main is 4420 divided by 1.87. And then 220. So all you're doing is it's fairly mechanical. And finally the income tax is 720 divided by 1.87. So you can always since check, we know we're right because that 3086, we know we've seen before, it's the 5770 divided by the average rate. So you will always be able to see since check that that's coming back to the correct answer, 3086, and we know we're back to the 5770, 5770 
divided by the average weight. So that's where those figures are coming from. It's the groupy splocky divided by the average exchange rate. We'll slot in the couple of adjustments because we didn't put them in as we go. So the OCI gets 352. So we have to do other comprehensive income. And FX differences on translation. So under IS21, all the FX differences for a sub will go in here, minus 352. So we'll just change that. I have it right. So that's our first one slotted in because we have a star beside it. We also have a star beside this, another minus 40 for the OCI as well. So you put a minus 40 there. So that's another FX difference that has to go to the other comprehensive income. The impairment, we're going to credit goodwill. That means it's an additional expense. So we put it under min expenses, minus 125, which again is your goodwill impairment. So that's another slotted in. And we also then have to remove revenue and cost of sales, um, which are top line adjustments. We put our stars there. So again, you may do this as you go along. I just happen to leave it to the end here. Either or is fine. You've set up the template. It makes sense to slot them in as you go along. So you don't have to come back to them. So I'm reducing revenue and I'm reducing cost of sales by putting a positive figure. It just so happened here. We didn't have any intergroup adjustments regarding dividends. So the full 220 still remains intact. So all I'm going to do then is sum across. So you can maybe pause it a minute and try it yourself and see can you figure out and finish off the consolidated statement or our blocking. So don't wait for me to go on and work through it. See can you tot up all the figures now. So I'll just do them quickly here. So see can you tot up all the figures and do the NCI allocation. So all we're doing is totting up parent plus sub plus the adjustments and we have other comprehensive income of 392 that is the full amount of the fx differences giving us total comprehensive income for the year to be 7731 plus 392 let's top it up so 7339 is the total comprehensive income for the year. So again, pause the screencast now and see, can you split that? When we have to do two splits, we have to do profit for the year attributable to owners of parent and the NCI. So that will be allocating the 7731. You need to split that between the parent and the NCI first. And then you'll also have to split total comprehensive income for the year attributable to gain owners of parent and the NCI. So when you have other comprehensive income, you have to do two splits. There will be marks for going that in the exam. You try it yourself and see, can I get the portion of profit for the NCI? So the portion of profit, remember we're looking for the S here. That S is to do with the OCI, so we're not worried about that till we get the total comprehensive income. But we have one S here about goodwill. So we're not just simply taking 3086 times 10%. It will be 3086 minus 125 times 10%. So we're saying we did make one adjustment to the, sh the subs profits for the year. We had goodwill and impairment. So the NCI's profit allocation for the year will be 296. So I'll just tot up all in to make it easier. 296, meaning the difference between the total profit and that is going to the parent. So 7731 is allocated um, overall, 296 to the parent and 7435 to the sorry, 296 to the NCI. 7435 to the parent. So finally, then we also have to allocate the 7339. So that will mean to the NCI, you always start with the 296 and you give them, them sh their share of the other comprehensive income. 
Now remember we split both of these, both of those had an S beside them. That means both of them will be shared by the NCI. So be two S's beside the OCI's. So that means it's going to be 392 times 10%. So they have to take a full 10% share. Meaning the NCI share will be 257. And the difference between that and the total will go to the parent, which is 7082. So that can be tricky that there will always be a two split when you have a foreign sub. So put that in a little tip sheet as you're going through because you'll always have other comprehensive income because that's where the FX differences go on the translation of a foreign operation. So they are the two main requirements we're asked for. But I think it's useful for completeness purposes that we'll go on and we'll finish off the consolidated statement of changes in equity as well. So I don't have any headings in. But again, remember, it's fairly straightforward. You take the headings from the statement of financial position. So we have ordinary share capital, share premium, reval surplus, retained earnings, FX reserve, and NCI. So you have six in total, and of course a total column as well. So sometimes they can be asked for this in exams. So then you have retained earnings. There. You have FX reserve, which is particular to this question. You'll only have an FX reserve column when you have a foreign subsidiary. And you'll also have the NCI. And that's the total. So remember, your starting point will always be the closing balance. So closing balances we're just taking from the statement of financial position. So that's 2 million. 300, 600, so all I'm doing is taking the balances here. So 2 million, 6, 300, 600. The retained earnings is 29245. And the FX reserve is minus 353. And the NCI we've calculated is 1157. So that's always your starting point. You'll always have that work done. You can only do the consolidated statement of changes in equity at the very end anyway, because you need to have the results of the statement of financial position and the splocky before you do anything. And we're essentially trying to work back to the opening balance, which we can then prove. So what will happen during the year was we had total comprehensive income for the year, and we also had an acquisition. So when you have an acquisition, you're going to grow the NCI, Total comprehensive income for the year. And again, watch and make sure you practice this and take the right figures. The figure that goes into retained earnings will be the profit for the parent. So that is this figure here, 7435. It's not 7082 because that includes the parent's share of this FX difference, which that goes itself to FX reserves. Just be careful you take the right one. So here. You take 7435. The NCI we'll do next. It gets the full amount, so it's slightly different. We don't split out the FX reserve, it gets the 257. And finally, then the amount that goes to the FX reserve is you can do it two ways. You can take 90% of this because you know that's the amount, or you can just say it is 7082 minus this. So it's essentially the Reduction of about 300,000. Uh, 300, That's the figure that goes. Because we've taken this one to be in retained earnings. The net of the retained earnings figure plus their share of other comprehensive income gets them down to 7 million. So the difference there is your 353. And the other line then is the acquisition. That's the value you initially put on the NCI, which is 900. So they're the only two movements we've no share issue during the year, or we have no um, difference page. So we don't have any other line items to explain. So we then can just prove, well, the opening balance here still must be 2 million, still must be 300, still must be 600. However, we get tricky here, so the opening balance here must have been this minus this, 21810. The opening balance here must have been zero. Because we started with nothing, we had 353 for the end during the period, and that's what we have finished up with. And the NCI then must have also been 
take off the movements during the year, start with zero as well. So, oh, excuse me. So it's nil, because nil plus 900 plus 257 gets to our closing balance. And again, we can since check that's correct. We can prove proof of opening retained earnings. It can only be made up of x1, the parent, and y into the sub. x1's opening retained earnings, we can get from the question, would have been closing 26580 minus their profits for the year. That will get us back to the 1st of January. So it'll be 26580 minus, in this case, 4770, which is your 21810. And of course, y int had nil because it was acquired during the year, i.e. on the 1st of January. So that means you couldn't have any post-acquisition profits at the start of the year because you didn't own it only, you only owned it at the 1st of January. So you couldn't have any to contribute. And that also makes sense why you have no foreign exchange reserve or no NCI because you only bought it during the year. Therefore, you could never have any share of post-acquisition profits for the prior year because you didn't own it. Right? So that was a fairly comprehensive question covering a foreign operation under IAS 21. Summer 16, question 2, X1 Limited.